So uh, making boundaries, boundaries history. Uh, well, I personally think that uh, boundaries are all in your mind. And boundaries are uh, also there in certain institutions that we have formed as human beings with our collective minds. There are various different kinds of boundaries. There are boundaries, uh, there are economic boundaries. The first thing that you think of is geographical boundaries. There are psychological boundaries, uh, there are schools of thought boundaries. So all these boundaries that we have in our mind, they manifest themselves in different ways, in different times of our lives. Say, schools of thought. You people must have heard of gharanas. Those are the different schools of music, the Indian classical music that we have in the country. So all of all those schools are highly respected. They have, um, uh, they have a repertoire which uh, range from uh, a whole lot of different ragas, which are handed over to them. Uh, from generation to generation, and some of the, uh, those uh, um, schools are probably uh, many hundreds of years old. But when you see that all of them are singing the same ragas in slightly different ways, they have a lot of rivalry between themselves. They are always talking about, you know, that karana does not know how to play this particular raga very well. Why do these people take an alap much, much longer than what we do? You know. Look at our gharana, our gharana has these kind of exp exponents. So we, we as human beings, have, have the knack of creating these um, boundaries in our minds out of nothing. You know, we create boundaries out of knowledge. Knowledge is something which is supposed to give you wisdom. But once a person gets knowledge, the person says, you know, don't tell me what to do. You know, I know, you do not know. For me, a knowledge is something which is, uh, which is something finite, because whatever you know is something finite in your mind. And, and, and the knowledge that is there in the universe to get is infinite. So anything uh, um, divided by infinity is zero. So what are you being proud about? So why are you forming these boundaries? You know, language becomes a boundary in various different ways. And various different um, uh, uh, <laughs> boundaries, uh, different kinds of boundaries manifest themselves in language. I'll give you a couple of examples, or probably more. You know, once in the US, in, at the airport, at an international airport, in the US all airports are international. So I had gone to a burger shop to buy a burger. And suddenly the lady who was going to give me the burger, she came up with a particular uh, sound which I could not understand. It, it sounded something like, you know, fries with it. You know, I couldn't understand. I said, beg your pardon? Again, I, I, the same sound came back, fries with it. I said, uh, could you please repeat it? Then I said, um, um, sorry, I couldn't understand, hello, you know. But the same sound would come back to me. And then somebody in the queue told me, you know, she's asking you whether I want fries with it or not. But that lady, in her mind, had set it up uh, in such a way that the dialect that she speaks is probably the only dialect in the world. She would not even show me a packet of uh, fries to ask me or make me understand exactly what she was trying to say. The same thing happened in Manchester. You know, the first time I had gone there, my brother came to drop me at the Manchester airport. And um, I was uh, about to check in. And suddenly, this uh, huge gentleman in uniform, double the size of me, said something which could not which did not make sense to me at all. And this gentleman would again keep repeating it without any change of expression. So I kept on asking, you know, and finally I had to tell him, you know, can you, can you speak in English? Can you Im imagine in Manchester I had to tell somebody that could speak in English? So my brother, who had been there for a few years, could understand the dialect. And he said that, you know, he's just asking you to pick up the suitcase and keep it on the conveyor belt. Why couldn't he have gestured? You know, when people come from outside, out here, we, we try and do a lot of things. We try and change our accent. We try and change, uh, uh, you know, um, do a lot of gestures to make people understand. And that's how things happen. And in this, you know, in, in France, again, a different kind of uh, uh, a problem arises. 
you go and speak to them in English, in English, they would just look through you or turn away. And finally, when I thought that you know, the best way to get through to them is to just speak in either Hindi or Bangla. The moment I spoke to them either in Hindi or Bangla, they were interested to communicate with me. And finally, they would gesture and do various things. And finally, no communication would, uh, will happen. They themselves would ask, do you know a little English? I said, little, little. And then the conversation will start in uh, some broken English. So uh, a language does become a barrier in various, various uh, different ways. Although these were manifestations of barriers or boundaries that you have in your mind, that gets expressed through language. But language also has its own barriers. If language could express everything, then we would not have had things like music, other forms of art, expression, gestures. So um, uh, 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 keeping all these boundaries, barriers, limitations in mind, I would like to play a small piece before I go ahead with the talk further. Thank you. There's a reason why I played this uh, piece. A, this is this being a Western instrument. The way I played it was very Indian. 
The significance of that will come later. But this particular guitar, which is one of the finest made guitars on earth, is actually made in Dehradun. A guitar being manufactured in Dehradun. That's quite a story, isn't it? Now, this is something what I wanted to tell you about. There's this gentleman called David Murray, who's from America, USA, who has set shop in Dehradun, who's one of the master luthiers in this world. And he has actually taken out people from rehabilitation and various other kinds of problematic lives, trained them to make guitars. And when you go and ask him, you know, who made this guitar, he'll never say, he'll never take the credit on himself. He actually talks about, you know, the neck has been made by some such person. You know, the body has been made by some, somebody else. These uh, carvings have been made by somebody else. So this gentleman who uh, made this guitar for me told me this amazing story about gu guitar manufacturing. Can I have some light on the audience, please? Um, so uh, this particular um, uh, gentleman uh, uh, told me this sto uh, story about uh, guitar manufacturing. Uh, for a long time in the US, uh, there was a company called, uh, or there is a company called Gibson, who used to make the finest acoustic guitars. Then sometime early uh, 20th century came in Martin. They started manufacturing guitars, and they also came out with brilliant guitars, and came out to be a major competitor in the market, and finally probably took over the market as far as acoustic guitars are, are concerned. Sometimes in late 60s and 70s, uh, a whole lot of individual guitar manufacturers or guitar uh, enthusiasts wanted to make guitars uh, on their own. And uh, at this point of time, um, amongst a few other such uh, enthusiasts was Bob Taylor who went to Gibson, the company, to ask them for certain know-how because they were having problems with, that, with the technology and uh, how to uh, build the guitars. So Gibson actually shut their doors uh, on their face. And then they went to Martin. Chris Martin, the owner of uh, Martin Guitars, they, he opened the doors for them. So these people went in, saw exactly how the guitars are being manufactured, and came out and started ma making the guitars. Taylor turned out to be a fantastic brand, and it came up to the level of sales that Martin, uh, Martin was enjoying for a long time. So Martin should have taken them as his competitors, but they didn't. In fact, sometimes in the uh, 80s, early 80s or something of that sort, um, they um, uh, Taylor, Taylor guitars, they needed a kind of a bail-off, um, monetary bail-off. At that point of time, Martin actually helped them out. They probably gave them a particular loan or without interest uh, to the tune of about $140,000 so that they can, you know, uh, again, revamp their marketing and come back to the market. So um, they did that. They came back to the market. And how? So both probably Martin and Taylor have the world's largest uh, share of guitar manufacturing of the really quality guitars. As far as Martin is concerned, instead of taking it as competition, they talked about it um, as Taylor guitars have helped them sell more guitars because they have brought in the consciousness in people's mind as to what quality is all about. And therefore, their guitars are also selling much, much more than before. Now, this particular culture actually percolated down to all the individual luthiers on earth. They never hide what they create, what they innovate, all their uh, technological know-how they share amongst themselves. So even when David was making this particular guitar, people, uh, luthiers from all over the um, world, they were actually giving their own thoughts and technology to David, exactly how to make this particular guitar. And <coughs> Martin and Taylor also on the other hand, they also benefited from them because all the luthiers actually told Martin and Taylor exactly how they could improve. And their guitars have been improving every year. Now, coming from this, um, um, 
you know, when, when I was invited for this particular talk, there was that one liner that was added to it. Um, now that the MNCs are not having these barriers of geography and they are looking at the rest of the world, uh, are we looking at breaking these barriers and uh, looking at a much, much uh, better globalization to help them? I would differ from here because when you have this profit margin in mind that you are going across the, uh, across the boundaries, just the geographical boundaries, not the mental ones, um, just to earn profit, just to earn that extra rupee or extra dollar, extra money, I would not call it breaking down barriers. Because I have nothing against the money. Money, um, the way it came in to replace the barter system as the society became more and more complex, was a very nice tool to ease the situation. Right? But money now is no longer just a tool. Money is a matter of pride. Money is a, is, a, is, a, is a tool to gauge success. Money is there to make more money. Money is not being uh, invested to produce for the needy. So uh, money has uh, become a kind of uh, a barrier, a boundary in certain ways. So um, uh, in so many di different ways, uh, a person with more money somehow does not interact with people with lesser money, right? Uh, and um, a whole lot of money is being spent on, say, medicine, okay, to build, uh, uh, you know, come up with new drugs and so on. Do these drugs actually reach out to more than 50% of the people who need those drugs and are existing below or at the level of success, uh, subsistence? So money per se, I think has become a boundary by itself. And MNCs clearly are not helping in making boundaries history. For me, when all the guitar manufacturers open their minds out to be able to share each and every thought with you know uh, uh, each other without any kind of uh, um, insecurity or um, um, to be able to hoard things, that in my mind is breaking barriers and leading into globalization. The fact that David Murray has come all the way from the US, set shop out here, doing so much of good to people who needed his help, I think that is breaking barriers. I think har the harmonium, which is uh, originally a, a German instrument being used in Indian classical and uh, Indian folk music extensively, that's globalization. Same thing has happened with the violin. Violin is being used um, with uh, uh, in the um, Indian classical, in Indian classical. They have learned how to hold the violin in a different way, tune it in a different way to suit their purpose and it works beautifully. So that I think is breaking boundaries and that I think is to be able to get out of the boundaries that we through our upbringing, through uh, a whole lot of things, up we create within our own mind. And the fact that I have been able to play on a Western instrument in an Indian way, I probably have been able to add to this process of breaking barriers in a minuscule way. Thank you. <laughs>